Hello and welcome to the Late Fragments podcast in which I discuss the apparently verboten subjects of politics, money, sex and religion with remarkable octogenarians. In this episode, I'm slightly pinching myself to be talking to Melvin Bragg, the ultimate interviewer. There isn't an important cultural figure that he hasn't interrogated. Bragg is not accustomed to being on the other side of the microphone. Despite a cancer diagnosis which has left him inevitably weakened, he recently recorded the thousandth episode of In Our Time and is currently adding the finishing touches to the second instalment of his autobiography, the first of which, back in the day, charted his journey from the Cumbrian factory town of Wigton to the hallowed halls of Oxford University. Bragg's extraordinary success story has not come without a price. Ten years into their marriage, his first wife, Mary Elsa Roche Bragg, took her own life. Over half a century and two marriages later, he still finds his greatest emotional refuge in learning. He says, It's curiosity that drives me on. The next thing. What if? Why not? I hope you enjoy listening. Melvin Bragg, welcome to Late Fragments. Fragments they are. You're the consummate interviewer. How much do you not like being interviewed yourself? I don't like it at all. <laughs> uh, well, that's not fair. I enjoy it as it goes on. I don't like the kick-off. I don't like these minute or two thinking, what's it going to be like? Am I prepared enough? Is it going in the direction that I can add something to? And then it settles down and it's fine. <laughs> We're going to start, if that's OK, with politics. Uh-huh. I'm going to take you back to 1950s Cumbria, to the Labour Party rallies that your mum, Ethel, took you to. Can you tell me about those? You have said it was the first time that you looked at the way that the world worked. Yes. Well, the Labour Party didn't exist in the town in which I was brought up while while I was very young. There was a Liberal Party and a Conservative Party. The opposition to the Conservatives was the Liberals. The Liberals were very strong in Cumberland, as they were in Cornwall, and they they were in various extremities of the country. But then the Labour Party was formed in the second half of the 40s, and very reluctantly my mother agreed to be treasurer, partly because nobody else wanted to look after money. Uh, And this was considered to be too dangerous a temptation (laughs) or too liable for people to get it absolutely wrong and be blamed for everything. But my mother and my father ran a pub, they tenanted a pub, and they thought, therefore, she knew about money. So she agreed to do it, persuaded by people who said, look, this is going to change the world. Very um, high ambitions uh, they put forward. And Mrs Bell, a very determined person who was chairman, the new chairman of the new Labour Party, uh, sort of bulldozed her into being the treasurer, which meant that there was quite a bit of work attached. First of all, they nabbed our kitchen for their meetings, uh, the the committee meetings, so I saw quite a lot of the inner core. Uh, And then my mother took it seriously, so I went to the open meetings. Uh, I went early with a man called Brian Henderson. His mother was also in the Labour Party. There was a famous announcement at the end of every Labour Party meeting. Um, Mrs Henderson boiled the water and Mrs Tate made the tea. Um... And we used to skid along, skid along the floor before they came into the, into the hall. And I quite liked the meetings, um, but I liked the marches better. Uh, there were marches, particularly in West Cumbria. This is a distinction that <laughs> will not be too familiar with your, your listeners. But the West Cumbrian strip on the Solway was basically heavy industry. There was some wonderful anthracite, rich coal there, and it enabled them to have a coal industry and a steel industry at the same time, from the same coming out of the same mines, iron ore and coal. And these were Workington and Whitehaven ships came and went. So that was heavy industry. So that was where my father's father was brought up, and he was one of 16 children. You'll have to take a deep breath, but that was it. My father was one of nine, and most of them worked in the pits, in the mines. And then my father moved to... Uh, inland uh, to work on uh, Wickton in a factory and that's where he met my mother uh, she was born and bred in Wickton 
uh, although we don't quite know how she was illegitimate, and we never, it was never, I never had the nous to track it down, and now the people who would know and would have told me willingly are all dead. So that's a bit stupid on my part, considering I've made a part of my living out of interviewing people. I will always regret that. It was to do with embarrassment, embarrassing myself, embarrassing them, the general air of embarrassment about it, illegitimacy, because illegitimacy, that the word used in those days was bastard, and that wasn't a word that you like to introduce into any conversation. Anyway, it was what it was. And we went on these marches, and they were terrific. We had floats which were the back of lorries, say the milk lorry or the coal lorry or the co-op lorry, and they cleared the back and they put little scenes on it, cowboys with tents, bands or scenes from a book that were, they were favoured. And the band, we had the bands, the town bands, and we invite the bands from Espatria, which was a nearby town, a mining town, that was a very good band. Wickton had a silver band, so we'd have two or three bands coming in and march through the town, go down to the show fields or go down to the park and have sports and uh, all that sort of thing. And they were great. They were really good. Or moved to go to the bigger marches on the West Coast where the industrial people were in Workington and Whitehaven. They were the real thing. Uh, they were serious about their politics. They were very politically engaged and knowledgeable, far more than we were. And those are big, big incidents in my life. And also made it quite clear that the only... <laughs> The only party in the world was the Labour Party because that believed in ordinary people, it believed in a better life, it believed in everything from you know, ice cream to perfect health to everything you wanted. So that was my introduction to the Labour Party and to politics. Hasn't changed much since, really. Your mum was a big believer in equality. Oh, totally. I mean, so was my father. They were just, as a lot of people are, and from different classes, from all sorts of classes, they were just natural English Democrats. Uh, they did. My father had heard a sermon when he was in the war uh, and the phrase, uh, he never forgot one of the phrases uh, and the preacher had said, you must remember, <coughs> you are better than nobody and nobody is better than you. And he thought that was wonderful. <laughs> Political convictions, I think, are probably to do with working conditions. I would have thought so, and, and what you inherit. I mean, my best friend, William Ismail, was a Tory by far and away, my best friend, his family were Tories, um, and they'd been brought up, he'd been brought up like that, so it didn't make any difference the fact that he was my best friend. And still today, does it affect your relationships with people, your p- yeah. politics? Well, not, no, not as much, but William and I were friends until he died a year or two ago, and I miss him a great deal. But I hadn't been well, so I've talked to the Labour Party about leaving the party, leaving the laws, but they wouldn't have it. And I'm now starting, oddly enough today, starting to go in again, and I'm going to make a big speech in uh, about three weeks' time about the arts, and uh, I hope to get cracking again. When I was well, I used to go quite regularly. Uh, the House of Lords, I think, is a, an extremely useful second chamber. Maybe it shouldn't be called the House of Lords, maybe it should be put together in a different way. But the funny thing is, we had a long session a few years ago about changing the House of Lords. And everybody in the House of Lords agreed the House of Lords should be changed. But nobody would agree about how it should be changed. Uh, Whether it should be elected, will that be a rival to the lower house? And therefore you'd have one house competing against another? Well, that wouldn't do. If it was elected, what was the basic constituencies? Were they the same constituencies or different constituencies? If they were different, why were they different? So if you lost your case in Cumberland about changing a road... In one house, did you go to another, the other house and say, oh, they did it, do you sit one house against another? It isn't as easy as it looks. Um, I think it should be made smaller, the House of Lords. But it's quite effective. That's the thing, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a story that trying to show its name. It's quite effective. People turn up, there are regular people, people who turn up regularly and they're very important. But just as important are the people who turn up now and then on sub- subjects about which they know an immense amount. So lawyers, a terrific distinction, will come when, when you, they know that their opinion is valued. And their speeches are very good. They're very good indeed. They're a piece of experienced people um, who've seen a lot, achieved a lot, and uh, come to give their opinion. It's very helpful. I think we're, a second house is essential in a democracy, I think it's the House of Lords is a very good shot at it. Uh, you can shoot 
acted in another way, you shoot holes in it. But it functions better than you think when you look at the amendments that it gives to the commons, budgets, and so on. The composition of it would benefit from reform, and that's in the air again, and I hope this time it pushes through. You're a passionate believer in the arts. You were recently quoted as saying, I think the government of the past 12 years has been entirely dedicated to Philistinism. More or less. I think that's an unfair crack, but it's got a lot of truth in it. I think the arts are in a position of great potential strength in this country, massively underrated by the government. I mean, just to talk in one almost Philistine way, uh, you put together the income from the whole film industry and the whole, let's say, motor industry, those two. The arts outsells, beats both of them hollow. Uh, and that's without including popular music, which I think is part, of, is part of culture. We are a massive industry, the arts, employing two or three million people. Highly skilled. It isn't just actors and writers, although, uh, of course, they're crucially important, but it's electricians, carpenters, costume makers, builders, and so on. There's an in- enormous number of uh, different jobs different skills put into this and we've built up quite a a good network but people seem to there are two things it's a contradictory it's it's very disturbing first of all people say what a good thing and the next thing they say what about cutting this yeah and when you go to councils, or when you don't go to councils, when you read about councils, as often as not, when it comes to making cuts, they make cuts in the arts. They think, oh, that's OK, that doesn't matter. Well, it matters enormously. A lot of people's livings, a lot of people's intellectual and imaginative life depends on, on, on the arts. Uh, we are probably the biggest single industry in this country. Mm. Nobody wants to talk about it in those terms. They think, oh, we've got enough. No, we haven't got enough. When they made the first railway line, they didn't say, oh, we made a railway line, we're going to stop. They actually went and made more and more railway lines. They made railway lines in this country, they made it all over the world. They developed the railway. That's what we should do with the arts, and that's what I'm going to rather more propose that and propose massively, massively more interference with, I'd say that, the school schedule so that young people are introduced to the art. People, arts teachers, are leaving state schools in droves. And yet it's one of the ways through for people, not only for their lives, but for their livelihoods. And when you talk about some of the greatest civilizations, just to use, you tend to, you tend to use great examples because there's a great deal written about them. It's not because you want to aggrandize your argument. It's just that when you say writers, you tend to talk about the great writers because everybody knows about them and you can get cracking on talking about them. But when you say what the city's known for, when you look at one of the greatest cities, Athens, quite a small city, what it's known for is its arts, the buildings, the statues, the theatres, the Olympic theatres, I think still the mass of plays which we put on. And that's only a fraction of what there is. Somewhere around uh, the Bay of Naples, there's there's buried dozens more plays, Greek plays that we don't... But what what we've got is enormous. Now, that made that civilization every bit as much as the army or the navy and gave it its distinction. Because you you are not just talking these about things on a pedestal. You're talking about if if you're going to do plays, you have to build a place, put it in. If you're going to have architecture, you're going to, you're going to, and you, are, you, you, you have the talent of the, you're going to make it look wonderful, which they did with the partner, if you're going, and so on and so forth. If you're going to do uh, this, that and the other, you need people behind those who are actually doing it at the front, and you need an educated public which will come along and watch, which we've got in this country. People do want to go along and watch, but they're being barred, not barred, that's unfair, but but it could be better than it is. You could, we could subsidise prices. The ENO, one of the great things ENO did was to subsidise, does, was to subsidise prices for young people. Some of them get in free. It's a tremendous institution, ENO. Why they picked on it, I'll never know, but at least that's been stopped in its tracks for the moment. 
This is an industry now. We've got to, we don't, we're rather distasteful about thinking about it as an industry. We think about it as an art, which it is. We think about it, we think about it as a sort of cherry on the cake. It isn't the cherry on the cake, it's the cake. Um, so I want, to, I want to put that forward. And, uh, and especially with kids who are not, to whom the arts are not available. We see it at the private, private schools, the public schools, when they have facilities, tremendous people come out of it, come out of them well-trained, ready to go on to ride and with an appreciation of and a knowledge of what's going on. They've been introduced to it by good teachers. Mm -hmm. They've developed skills. They've developed taste. At the age that matters, and the age that matters is sort of between, as far as we can work out, sort of between 6 and 7 and 15 and 16. That's the age that matters. That's when it sinks in. That's when most people who do embryo things get going. Whether it's David Hockney writing online, painting online, drawing on liner when he was seven or eight and not being able to tell to stop, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> or in, when you look at the, Rena the Renaissance um, studios of the great painters, Bernard, whoever it is, the kids all over the place mixing paints uh, and so on and so forth. So... That's part of what I hope to say, rather more here coherently. And we just don't appreciate it. Mm. We don't develop it. It's staring us in the face, you know, and yet we... And they don't do it. Can I ask you where this seeped into your own life, this awareness of the importance of art and culture? Um... Well, I was lucky. Um, I think it was uh, from the start. I, I was brought up in this town, largely working class town. We were working class. Uh, I remember talking to David Hockney. <laughs> you mentioned him, and he said, "Yes." Uh, he said, "We, said, but we always thought we were first class." He said, <laughs> I said, "Yes, that's it. We did. We always thought we were first class." But uh, what did I lack? Uh, because I was brought up in a Christian community, we had a, we had in the town of five or six thousand people. We had twelve places of worship. Everyone had a choir. We had the St Mary's, which I was I was C of E, had a wonderful choir. Uh, choir master was a man called Mr Mitchinson, who was an electrician. His father played the organ. We practiced. We had prayer choir practice on Thursdays. Was serious. He was a serious. We sang anthems. We, we really knew about music, even though we didn't think... We didn't go around saying, oh, we know about classical music. I mean, class when you turn on radio, it was a bit of a shock. But actually, when you go on Sunday, you'd be singing it. <laughs> you'd be singing these anthems. So I had all that musical education. Now, there's something about music, there's no question, that penetrates uh, parts of the brain that other things don't seem to reach as well, whether it's pop music, and we've been living in a great area of pop music where, where pop music is now part of culture, which it wasn't when I was a kid. Pop music was the bottom of the bottom of the pile. I remember when I started the South Bank show, I was determined to bust that one, so I started with Paul McCartney. Um, it took a bit of getting, actually, in those days. Uh, it, was all very, it was all pop. And, uh, and, the, <laughs> and I got the... Royal Shakespeare lined up, done a film with them, ready. I could be in the Berlin Philharmonic lined up, we'd done a film with them. Ready. But I started with McCartney. <laughs> One of the reviewers gave a big review, saying, We're very pleased that this is happening, ITB. But we draw the line at Paul McCartney. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> That's 40 years ago. It changed a bit, hasn't it? What year was that? 19... that 1978. January 1978. So even though Paul McCartney was a member of the Beatles, they still drew a line at him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they drew a line at Paul McCartney. What did I do? I just got on with what I wanted to do. When I started the South Bank show, I decided that we would, we would do popular music. And I thought that we would do television drama uh, before uh, West End drama. We did West End drama quite soon, but we did television drama first, Dennis Potter, just to show what we were about. And so we went on through the things, and uh, I didn't get I didn't get many ticks from the uh, <laughs> from the critics. 
But then a couple of things happened. Well, one thing happened. We won something called the Pre Italia, which uh, sounds like a racing car. Right? Uh, no English company had won that before. It was like, it was from the arts. It was a big Oscar at the time. We won that, I think, certainly two years, perhaps three years running. Well, that shut them up. <laughs> I mean, the way to shut them up is you get big audiences, which we didn't get big audiences. How could we be putting on at quarter to 11 at night? Anyway, big audiences, big reviews, or you win big prizes. If you can do one of those, you're OK. If you can do two, you can stay long. So we were OK. Can I take you to money? Are you OK to talk about money? Well, it depends whose money. <laughs> be a short talk about mine, but still, there we go. I'm interested to know what your view was of money when you were growing up, because your parents were working class, but not too badly off. No. Well, my father paid me for working in the pub. And some idiot in private eye recently said I was, uh, a, a, whatever it's called, I was exploited and I was, I was a lucky one. I loved working in the pub. I mean, first of all, I liked working in the pub. They're very nice people. I liked the jobs, carrying the beer up from the cellar. I liked learning how to tap a barrel so you could clean, clean bitter. I liked everything to do with it. I had to sweep the front of the... We had a front where lorries could draw and drop off the barrels. I had to sweep that every morning. I, swept the, I had to swill out the gents. I wasn't too keen on that, but you did it. So I liked working in the pub. And at quiet times, my dad let me stand behind the bar from I was about 12 onwards and serve the odd drink. I loved it. So, um... Were you aware of any lack? In not terms really. Of... No, because my dad paid me for that. It was, it was his, he was a very, very clever man. And when he, as I say, he's from a family of nine, he passed two scholarships for the North... Western parish churches. One was to go to a, a big public school at Liverpool. I forget the name. He couldn't go, of course. Well, it wasn't enough money. And the other was to go to a local grammar school. He couldn't go, of course, because of the money. He was the oldest boy to get out and work when he was 14, which he did. He never, we'd never, he never moaned about it. Um, there was no sense of him being thwarted, but he was very clever. And, uh, and he realised when I wanted to leave school... Well, I just thought I'd leave school at 15 like everybody else. William did and Eric did and Robert did. We all left, uh, even though it was a grammar school. Um, the <laughs> farmer's sons already left. They didn't come in for harvesting and all that. just didn't come to school. Um, and um, Mr James, my teacher, history teacher, as I had learned later, I learned about 40 years later, because he, my father didn't tell me this, and Mr James didn't tell me this, went to see my parents three times to persuade them that I should stay on. I mean, I didn't want to go to university. Mr James wanted me to go to university. And I liked Mr James and said, OK. But by saying OK, and my friends all left, my father instantly spotted money that I would they would be getting a wage and I would not be. So he gave me, he gave, he gave me what he worked out was what they would get after they'd given money to their parents. And he worked it out correctly. So I had the same as they had. Oh, amazing. To do serious things, like take your girlfriend to a dance. So he gave you what he didn't have, yeah. your dad? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you ever get a chance to acknowledge that? He knew that, yeah. Came to Oxford once when I was there. And he knew that, but he never. He was pleased that he was. He'd got a full life himself. Mm. He was a very good bowler. Played for the county. He liked running the pub. He ran a hound trailing association, which was very big in Cumberland. Hounds going across the fells. It was a unique sport in that part of the world. He he got on with his life. He must have been very proud of you, I imagine. And I was very proud of him. After leaving Oxford, you went to work at the BBC. Yeah. Where you've spoken of people working 
not being terribly well paid, no. but doing something that they loved. Yeah. How important to you in your life has been doing what you love? How, how, how primary has the importance of that been? Well, it's been this whole thing. Obviously, it's nice to be well paid, and sometimes I have been. But I've done what I wanted to do. I'm very, very lucky to be able to. I mean, the BBC, which just opened Sesame, I had no idea that life was going to be as easy as that. You know, doing what you wanted to do. I just thought work was something hard and made you tired. <laughs> and I didn't particularly want to be a teacher, so that didn't leave anything except working hard and making you tired. Money, well, the BBC was the BBC, and I, I think I got paid £620 a year. Pretty sure I did. And I was married then when I left university, and it wasn't a lot. Um, he just got on with it. Uh, then I just kept things turned up that I wanted to do, and I was lucky that I, I, we sort of scrambled along. Uh, Lisa, my first wife, had a small allowance from her parents. That helped. Um, then the first book made £150 before the et agent took a slice. <laughs> and that was all right. I thought, this is, this is a life. <laughs> I didn't, I just wrote it, well, I wrote it several times, sent it off. Um, did I do anything for money? I suppose when I went to Hollywood, I thought, this is, this is to, to, to write there, to write... Um, I'd done Superstar and they, they wanted me to write something else. But I didn't like it. What have been your extravagances in your own life? Um, well... There are a lot of paintings in this room, but mostly they've been picked up along a long life, mostly by Cumberland, and a lot of them by friends. I suppose that could be called an extravagance. I don't drive. I'm not interested in cars. We have a cottage in the Lake District, which we've had for 40 years, and I bought it for very little because it was a small 18th-century cottage of absolutely no architectural distinction, adjunct to a barn which had no roof. <laughs> um, which had possibilities, obviously, as a big room, but real money wasn't wasn't buying the place. It was very cheap, believe me. But actually, find the money to get a roof on, which we did. <laughs> I thought, but I don't think that was an extravagance. I did that to get the kids, give the kids a chance not to live in London. I was a bit worried about London, wandering around. I didn't know how London worked for children, but I know how it worked up there. We were in a northern hamlet. North, North Cumbrian Hamlet. And I just knew you let them out the door and they wander around and life's OK. Mm. Uh, which is what happened to them. And they keep going up to college now so with their children, so that's great. There was great poverty around you when you were growing up, it wasn't was, yeah, there? Yeah, it wasn't great, even though they were, it was getting better. I mean, the National Health Service helped it to get better, physically to get better. But yes, there was. But we had two factories in the town. We had a man's factory making rayophane paper, the sort of paper you put around cigarette packets, the transparent paper. That was a very good factory, it still is. And then we had the women's factory, red maids made clothes. And my mother worked there. She was, uh, she sold, she made buttonholes for about six or seven years. Yeah, then she got married and she got fired. That was, that, that was the way things worked in those days. Asked to leave, I suppose, would be a better way to put it. And then she went and uh, cleaned houses. I worked a bit on the post. Hard workers, your parents. Yes, they were. Yeah, they were. As you have been. On the whole, yeah. You get paid for working hard. Well, you get paid for doing what you want to do. Mm. Yes, and I do work hard. Yeah. Not as hard as some people, but yeah, OK. Yeah, I think we can give you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to move on now to sex. Going back to your mum... You mentioned that she was illegitimate and that that was something that maybe tainted her life and, by extension, yours. The world we are now living in is a world away yeah. from a world where that was the case. Yeah, it is, thank God. It's improved greatly. You've written about growing up in that time and how one got married. Mm. You no, know, there was no endless stream of relationships and sexual encounters, you you married somebody you loved and you nearly married... Joan. You nearly married your first girlfriend. That's Joan, yeah. Still, we still talk every week. Do you? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, Sundays. 
<laughs> That's lovely. Yeah, she's up in Cumberland still. Yeah. You first married when you were very young, when you were 21. How much did that decision dictate the man that you are today? Oh, quite a lot. I mean, it's... Um, in one way, it was a, a wonderful thing that happened to me. In another way, it completely skewed everything. It was sort of never going to work, and yet we made it work for a few years. But it was too difficult for Lisa and me uh, to make it work. And also, it gets very complicated. The Lisa had had a difficult life in one way. She had a very, she came from an extremely distinguished family, um, both intellectually and every other way. And uh, Oxford had been an escape for her, or somewhere she was sent to. Or so. And she she really cleaved to Oxford, and she was making her way in Oxford. She was writing for Charwell uh, about art. She was at the uh, Ruskin School of Art and she had an exhibition. Well, I organised the exhibition, her first exhibition. But then we moved out of Oxford when I got a job, when I got the London job. And I think that was very difficult for her. It was very difficult for both of us. We couldn't find anywhere to live. So we found somewhere in Finchley, which was insane. We should have stayed in the middle of London. Uh, so that just the journey in and the journey back to wasn't it was it took me away. And she had no friends, nobody there at all. Uh, it was very difficult for her, very very difficult, just an alien place, and uh, that was one of the things. It was very difficult. Yeah, but she was writing and I was writing, and I thought that would somehow redeem everything. <laughs> writing meant that everything was fine. You're writing about her, presumably, in your new book. Yeah, I have to, you know, I've just finished the first draft of the new thing and I've just finished the time when we met and uh, married. I've written a couple of drafts. I've got one more draft. I'm sure I've got one more draft to write, at least one more draft. What would your advice, Mel, then be to someone setting out on married life? <laughs> You've been married three times. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the secret... <laughs> to a successful marriage. I've got no idea. No, I think it might be, one thing might be, but just as a guess, I, I think people are brought up in the same place and know each other well. I mean, if I'd stayed in Wigton, I would have married Joan, who, whose parents knew my parents, and they'd been the dancers together. It was a small town. So I think that would have had a chance of really lasting, because it was a... The French, all those sort of building blocks were in place. We knew each other's pasts. We we knew each other. We had mutual friends. We, I think that matters. That, I think solid marriages, marriages are often like that. Mm. Uh, or marriages where people are doing the same thing. Two people working at X or um, working in this career or the other career. But I don't really know. I've got no idea. I think I'm not the best person to ask about that, frankly. <laughs> Can we talk about religion? Do you believe in God? Um, no, but I do. I'm still fascinated by what happened that set it all off. Because something which I, I think you can only call an intelligence set it off. Or it's an intelligence or an accident, isn't it? Um, and if it's an accident, I'm not all that interested. If it's an intelligent, I'm very interested. Because the intelligence now, I've, I suppose you've seen the things that come from the new Webb telescope billions of years away, far beyond the Hubble telescope. You think, God, that's all going on. And what... I mean, enormous galaxies that we never heard of or seen, way out there, billions and billions of light years away. Well, you know, difficult enough to get to Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> There's a beautiful passage in your memoir back in the day in which you write about what feels, when you're writing about it, like a quasi-spiritual experience. You're looking out over Binsey Fell. Do you yeah. remember the passage? Yes, I do, yes. Do you need me to read back any of it to no. you? No. No, no I do remember but you, you feel a sense of connectedness with something yeah. bigger than yourself. Oh, yes, I do. I think a lot of people do. I think they have those moments. And there is a connectedness. It's, it's, it's visceral. And that's why people go to places like the Lake District. But I think people can find it in parks or having flowers in the house. I don't think you have to 
go somewhere. All the Lake District was a dramatic example of it. A dramatic example given the um, given it at a mouthpiece of that man, Wordsworth, up there. Mm. Um, and so they, when they read Wordsworth, they would say, yes, I, I feel like that. Yes. Or when they listen to certain music, they'd say, these are my feelings. But it was the words that set a lot of that off. Yes, but it's... And on the other hand, it, it means so... Any expiation one has is so small compared with what's been the result of the creation, whoever created, whatever created, what's going on. I feel, I mean, but I have certain feelings which, which... But I think they come from childhood rather than from adult thought. I think that, you know, I had a very Christian childhood. I mean, I started going to Sunday school when, I don't know, four or five. And they didn't mess about in those days in Sunday school, you know. It was the Old Testament and it was... And at school, every morning at school, we were read two lessons, one in the Old, one in the New Testament. And then there's a choir practice and then with the, then with the actual singing in church on Sundays. I think all that went in. And I think that's my sort of equivalent of David Hockney drawing on a liner when he was seven or eight. Do you miss the religious certainty of your childhood? Um, yes, I think I do. But I know it's I know it's there. I know it was experienced. But I know it's something that I and I'm fascinated by it. I mean I've written about the formation of the King James Bible and one or two other things. I like, I mean, I went to midnight, my daughter, one of my daughters is a vicar, and um, I went to her midnight mass just a couple of weeks ago. And it's a very good service, and she's a very good preacher. And so that was an experience, and I thought, but I thought I was taken back, not taken on. I don't think it in any way directs my life as it used to, as I used to hope it did don't even know that it really did in those days, but I used to, you used to hope you were good, you know, try to be good like I know that I should. That's my prayer at the end of the day. That was the end, two last lines of a very popular song. <laughs> Where do you get your spiritual sustenance from then? The past. The past. Or, or the same as many people, walking in nature. Mm. Um, yeah, those two things. And sometimes from works of art, music particularly. Do you live more in the past as you get older? Yeah, yeah, well, there's more of it, isn't there? <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> We're almost finished, Melvin. I just wanted to say there's, there's a, you said once there's a lot about 80 that's much nicer than being 30. Well, I, I change my mind that from day to day. There is a lot much nicer. You, you know, you are where you are and that, that's it. Mm. Uh, you've made the big decisions for better and for worse they're made and the big decisions that you've made you're not going to make again because you're too old and, and because you're committed to the older decisions so a lot of, I mean basically you're in the waiting room aren't you when you're my age you're 84 when you're coming up to 85 um, my father died at 83 so did his father my mother lived into her nineties, but then she had Alzheimer's for the last six years so I don't know whether I would it's not a life I would like. Your mind is obviously still amazing. Well, I about that. Working and writing, you've done the thousandth episode of In Our Time recently. What continues to drive you on? Curiosity. Curiosity. I think it's what continues to drive our species on. Curiosity. Mm. Yes. The next thing. There's all sorts of other things, but they, there's one thing. It's just the... Uh, relentless curiosity what if, what if, what if why not, why not, why not that's what's going on I think in this waiting room <laughs> Melvin Bragg thank you very much thank you thank you for listening to the Late Fragments podcast that was the last episode in the current series but there are many more episodes available all of them full of wit and wisdom for you to listen to simply search up late fragments on your podcast app of choice sit back and enjoy you can also follow us on all the usual social media channels 
My thanks as ever to Louis Fulford-Smith for the sound production and edit and to Harry Dundas for the music and original score. Until next time, goodbye.